Let me try it again. Good morning. Our reading from Scripture, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 39 through 45. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. May God bless us today with the reading of this word. Amen? Amen. So on Friday, December 7th, on my social media feed, this picture popped up as a memory. You have that happen to you? A picture pops up on your memory, in your photos, on your iPhone, smartphone, or on your social media feed. This This picture was taken on December 7th, 2019, four years ago. It was taken on Beale Street about 6.30 in the morning in Memphis, Tennessee with three of my best friends in the whole world. Uh, Those three guys in the picture with me are three men that I love very deeply and we've done a lot of life together. We've shared a lot of life together. That was four years ago. And those three guys in the picture had no idea that the next week, Teresa and I would be coming to Tulsa to meet with a search committee to talk about possibly coming and moving here. And we had no idea, Teresa and I had no idea that in January that we'd be saying yes to God's call to move our family here and to begin our life here uh, and to serve this congregation. And this actually for Teresa and I will be our fourth Christmas with you. And we're so grateful and we are so thankful and we love you and we love our church family And it's been a wonderful uh, four Christmases with you. So, thank you. Either you're being nice or polite or something, but anyway, but thank you. (laughs) But enough about us. I don't want to talk about us. I want to talk about uh, the the young man uh, in his early 40s on the left of the picture with the hat that says run the run hat. You see, we're in Memphis for the St. Jude Memphis Marathon, and Brian uh, is, was pacing the marathon, which meant that he had to be a good enough athlete to run carrying a sign. Can you imagine running 26 miles holding a sign? He's holding a sign, and he would gather people around him so he could encourage them. Brian is an encourager. And so he would help this group of people to achieve their goal. And so that morning, it, we, we had such a great time. We were laughing, carrying on. We were excited about what was going to happen. And after the race, we just had a, a great time laughing, driving all the way back home on the trip. Brian, we, we love Brian. But what Brian did not know in that picture, that day that photograph was taken four years ago, was that that would be Brian's last Christmas. Six months later, Brian woke up in the middle of the night and grabbed his chest and died of a massive coronary. We we were shocked because, well, Brian left behind two beautiful children, a whole community of people that loved Brian, and he was an amazing athlete. He was in the picture perfect of health, and not only just a great athlete, but Brian was just a great human being, an exceptional athlete, but never bragged. He was always humble always an encourager, always helping other people. And when I saw that picture uh, come up in my feed, it just kind of brought all that grief back. 
Or when his girlfriend called me and said, David, we've, we've, lost, we've lost Brian, the shock and the, and the sadness. And today, my friends in that picture, uh, I sent a picture to them, and we just sort of spent some time thinking about him, and we still feel that loss deeply. You know, that's the thing about Christmas. Christmas is a time of year where we feel this incredible joy of the season, the music and the friendship, the lights and the joy. But it's also the time of year where we also feel profound sadness and we feel loss and and we feel grief too. Because that's the thing about Christmas is it has this way at Christmas, there's something sentimental about it, right? It kind of pulls us back into the past And we remember people we love that we've lost. But then again, if you've got children around you, grandchildren or children, children anywhere, it's it's always pulling you the other direction too, into the future. So Christmas has this look back and this look forward. That's what the Christmas season really is all about. I remember one time my son asked me, he said, Dad, why is Nana sad? Because it's Christmas. And I said, it's because your Nana misses people that she loves. And I know you do too. We all do. Now my purpose in the message is not, is not to make you feel sad this morning. And you know me well enough to know that, that I would never use the death of a friend to manipulate you emotionally. You know, you're just one heartbeat away from eternity, so you better give today or, you know, And I would never use your grief that way. But I bring that grief to our attention because it reminds us of something that's true. And I wanted to make this important point because I believe it is so absolutely true. Life, there is a life that we plan and there is a life that we have. We make our plans And then life has other plans. And real life is lived somewhere in the, you know, the the messy middle of it all. Because that's just life. Life is filled with all these great joys. Births and celebrations and birthdays, but also filled with great losses and sadness. And also with sorrow. It's, It's all of it. All of it's mixed in there together. Times in life when we have great health, times in life when we have sickness, times when we feel great joy, and times when we feel sorrow, times when we're on the mountain, and times when we're down in the valley of the shadow of death and we're facing something that's scary and tragic and frightening to us. And the reality is that you can feel joy and Sadness all at the same time because all those things can be true all at once. That is just what life is. But what strikes me and grabs me about the message that we share and that we embrace as a community is this message of grace. The unconditional love of a God that will not let us go. And the whole story of Scripture found in the gospel, which means good news, the good news is that this God that we see at work in Jesus, at work in the world, is always moving toward us in grace. Always. Meeting us where we are. In the good times and the hard times, meeting us on the mountaintops, and then meeting us down in the valleys. Now, this, this may be the moment in the sermon where you lay down and take a nap. I'm not sure. But I hope you at least remember this. That you are not alone. You'll ne- you may feel alone, but you're not alone because the message of the Christmas season is that God is with us. I- I've been reading through the first two chapters of Luke's Gospel, reading over these narratives again and again, And I love the way that God brings God's grace to this weary world. That first part of the book is just filled with weary people. People who are wearied by poverty, sickness, disease, 
suffering and death, uh, people who were wearied by kings who ruled with intimidation and fear, and people who were wearied by religion. Religion then and now sometimes does blame the victim. You know what I mean? Like, there's a reason why you're sick. There's a reason why you're sad. Uh, there's a reason why you're poor. Uh, there's a reason why you're paralyzed. There's a reason why you're blind. There's a reason why your family member died. There's a reason why you're not rich. It's because God is angry with you. That's bad religion. It's not the religion of the Gospels. And let me just say this to you, uh, as kindly and with as much consideration as possible, that if your religion wearies you, or your religion wearies someone else, if what you believe makes you weary, then I would ask you to carefully reconsider what it is that you believe. Because that's not the God we see at work in this story. You see, you see in this story, it begins by setting us up for something. It says, in the time of Herod the king. Now when you hear that, in comparable literature, at that time frame, um, what would be expected next to you hear the, the annals of a king? You'd hear the stories of the accomplished from the king. Because Herod and other kings like this in this age, they thought they had God-like status. And they pushed people around, you know. Pushed them around, pushed armies around, took human life, made, you know, forced themselves of others. They built great structures, architectural wonders, uh, conquered territories because they were in charge of the world. But that's not the story of this gospel. Because very quickly you realize that God is something different, that God is working behind the scenes. While all these powerful people were doing all these things, God was moving in the lives of unimportant people. Because the first thing that happens is, when you open up a story, you expect to hear the story of kings and powerful people. But instead, God moves in mysterious ways through ordinary, flawed people. And you hear the story of two women. And that's remarkable, too, because in that culture, women were not valued or considered regular citizens. They were a little lower than men. And they had no power and influence. And the very fact that the whole thing that God is going to do in the world is not going to be done through some great king, but through two ordinary women. An older woman who can't have children and an unmarried teenager. And the only thing that qualified them for that work was their willingness to say yes to what God was going to do. They accepted God's invitation to be vessels to bring God's love and grace to a weary world. It's a remarkable story. Can, can you feel that? Can you, can you grasp how it is that God works there? Now, you recall from last week that Zechariah, he was on duty, Elizabeth's husband, was on duty in the temple, and he was there burning incense, and the last thing he expected was to encounter the presence of God. He looks over, and there's Gabriel, and Gabriel says, hey, Zechariah, you're going to have a baby. You and your wife are going to have a baby. She's going to conceive, and he's going to be great. He's going to be the, the forerunner of the Messiah. He's going to bring people back to the Lord. And Zechariah said, really? I'm not so sure. Even if it's true, I'm not sure I want that. And, and it says in the story that immediately uh, the angel says, you're not going to be able to speak for nine months. I'm going to give you some time to think about it. Now, the fun thing is to think about what happens next in the story. Can you imagine Zechariah going home and then attempting to explain to his wife what's about to occur? Yeah, you've tried this one before. Think about it, anyway. How do you, how do you, explain, to, how do you, explain, how do you explain to her that she's going to have a baby when they're in their retirement years, when they're thinking, facing the ending of their life, when now they're talking about the beginning of a new life. And so you have to understand that Elizabeth perhaps would have been very, very skeptical of all this, hard to believe. But then over the next few months, she does conceive, she does become pregnant, and she begins to show. And can you imagine being in your 80s and experiencing morning sickness and you're already tired, <laughs> right? And it says in the scripture that she went into seclusion. 
for five months. I mean, who could blame her? You have to under, you'd have to understand it, right? In one sense, even though her whole life she had faced the disappointment of not having children, she probably didn't want a baby. I mean, if, you have, if you're a grandparent and your grandkids come over, you love having them for a few hours, but you're glad when they go home too. Because can you imagine at, you know, 70 or 80 years old being the primary caregiver for a child? Wow, she wasn't sure she wanted it. But then again, probably it's because maybe, maybe she had experienced the pain of a miscarriage. The hoping, the planning, the disappointment, the, gr- the grief and loss that no one understands, and then having to explain it. And she didn't want to go through that all over again. Now, meanwhile, about 80 miles to the north in, in, in Nazareth, there's Mary, her cousin, equally insignificant, unmarried teenager, nothing remarkable about her. The same Gabriel that appealed, appeared to Zechariah, we love crying babies, it's great, that's okay. That's okay, we're good. So, so Mary hears from the angel Gabriel, and Gabriel says, guess what? God has favored you, Mary, and you are going to have a baby. <laughs> and she says, well, how can this be? Because I'm an unmarried teenager, and what will people think? And Gabriel says, hey, What's going to happen is the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you're going to conceive and you're going to give birth to a child and the baby's going to be great. He's going to be amazing. He's going to be awesome. He's going to be the son of the Most High God. He's going to take the throne of David and he will reign forever. She says, I don't see how it can happen. And he says, with God, everything is possible. And Mary says, well, let it be. And the thing is that we're reminded in these two stories as we move deeper into the Christmas season is to remember that God often works in ways we don't expect. That God works through the lives of ordinary people who have joys and sorrows, whose lives are messy. And that this God meets us in the midst of our lives, in the midst of joy and sorrow. God meets us in the valleys and God meets us in the mountains. Wherever we might be, and what God does is God invites us to be a part of the story. God invites every one of us to be a part of the story. And God meets us in all those places. And so it's possible to have joy and sorrow all at the same time because God does not work according to our plans, and that's okay. In fact, it's more than okay. It's beautiful, and it's messy. It's hard, but it's grace. Now, in the next part of the story, we see that Mary packs up and travels from Nazareth to the hill country of Judea to be with her cousin. The angel says to her, hey, your your cousin Elizabeth, she's pregnant too. Now, you can imagine all the harsh realities of being a teenager, being unmarried in that time and culture, and having a baby, and then trying to explain to people that what's happened, and people not believing you. At the very least, they wouldn't believe you. At the very least, um, they would shame you. At the very worst, the penalty for a baby out of wedlock might even be possibly death. How do you explain to your family? How do you explain to Joseph? And so we don't know what she was thinking or feeling, but she must have been scared and worried and fearful and all those things. And so she travels 80 miles, can you imagine, to go be with Elizabeth. And I love this part of the story. When she walks in the room, no, now here are these two women who are just had this big unexpected thing happen in their life, meeting. Can you imagine the emotion and the feeling of the moment? And Mary walks in the room, and when Elizabeth sees her, the baby, six months in her womb now, leaps for joy. And full of the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth says, Blessed are you who will give birth to the Son of God, and blessed is the baby in your room, and blessed are you, Mary, for saying yes to God. And what happens next, it's just kind of like an explosion of joy. 
There's a lot of rejoicing. Mary launches in to this great song, the Magnificat, which talks about all the great things that God is going to do. And then Mary's there for three months until the baby's born. And then Zechariah gets his voice back and he starts singing. Everybody's singing. All the joy in the midst of all of it. So I make these three observations then. The first is this. You know the old saying, misery loves company? Well, it's true, right? Yeah, you think that's bad. Let me tell you, right? Uh, you know, complainers gather complainers. Negative people gather negative people. And I guess there is some sort of comfort in knowing that somebody's life is just as bad as yours. You know, misery loves company. But it's also true that joy loves company. That, that joy is something that God gives us, but joy is found in making connection with others. And that's what we see in the story. Here is Mary going through her thing, and here's Elizabeth going through her thing. And when they come together in the midst of community, joy comes to life inside of them. And so the reality is in this room, we got people in sad times and happy times. All, that, all the messy stuff is mixed up in all the middle of it. But there is joy that is found in making connection. We are meant for warmth. We're meant for connection. We're meant for love. We're meant for relationships. And joy is found in the relationships. And I guess one of the best things we have to offer the world is community that loves everyone with unconditional grace and love and joy, no matter who they are, where they've been, or what's going on in their life. The other thing is, I think, is that there is a real invitation to joy in the story. Oh my gosh, you know, you can look at the world, and there's so many problems in the world, and, you know, we don't live with our head dug in the sand, but God's at work in our world, in spite of the evidence to the contrary. And we know from what the story tells us that, that love will be born in our world. It's going to happen. Christ is at work in our world, whether the church comes along or not. God's grace will find a way into the world, whether we participate or not. God is going to redeem this world. This world belongs to our God. I believe that with every ounce of who I am as a human being. And we have an invitation to be a part of it. To just say yes to God, an invitation to the joy that comes in serving. Now, here's my third observation, and it's uh, understandably somewhat unconventional. So there, there's a Greek word, a Greek word used for Mary in the Orthodox tradition called Theotokos. Repeat it back to me. Theotokos. It means the one who bears God in the world, the one who, through her life, Mary, brought God into the world. Now, there's a way in which Mary bears God in the world that we will know, that's singularly unique. But it's also true that we are also called to be Theotokos, God-bearers, people who bring God into the world through our lives, bring joy to the world through our lives, bring grace to the world through our lives. And I, I've been thinking about that. This is what I think. I think that, that the greatest gift, perhaps, that we can bring to our community and to the world are children that we bring into the world. Just, just as Mary and Elizabeth brought children to the world who impacted the world, we're called to do the same thing. And it's true. As a church, we nurture children in the womb of our family, this church family. And the greatest thing that we can do is to help our children and help our youth come to know and love, know the God of love we see in Jesus and to feel and to know that love. Because a lot of our youth, young people are entering the world anxious and afraid and weary. And we want them to enter the world full of joy and life to change the world. Right? And so the thing that I think is the most important thing that we do is, is that we want to be a church that nurtures children and youth. And here's what it is. 
you know, right now, you know, we're searching, we're looking for a family pastor because it's important in our church, and we're looking for a youth minister. We're, we're, we're working on this part of our church life. But I want to say this to you. We need more than a family pastor. We need more than a youth minister to nurture children and youth. We need a church that ministers to children and youth, and there's a difference. You see, it's about relationships. A friend of mine recently said to me and said to a group I was in, said, hey, you know, we used to think that in youth ministry that we need seven, you know, one adult for every seven kids. And she said, no, it's not true. We need seven adults for every kid. (laughs) Because it's about relationships. And the reality is our kids don't need, I mean, ski trips are fun. And Taco Tuesday's fun. You know, fun activities are great. We want them to like being at the church. But what they're going to remember are the relationships that they have with other people. For instance, this morning, Ezra, Ezra Pease, Ezra Pease is six feet tall and he's in the fifth grade. He's a big kid. Don't trade punches with him before church. It's not a good idea. Ezra may never remember anything I ever say from the pulpit, but Ezra remember the Sunday in Advent when David Emery traded punches with him and watched him go like this for the first service. Because I'm just having fun with him and building a relationship with him that will outlast anything I might ever teach him. And so for us to fully nurture children, we have to be a church that ministers to youth and children to be able to bring them to the world. This world is filled with joy and sorrow and loss, all those things. It's all true at all the same time. But this God of grace is at work in the midst of all of us. And here's the best thing about it. You ready? Joy loves company. Say it with me. 